right, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Happy to see you, happy to see you. I want to say uh, just a quick word about um, our membership classes coming up in September. The, the membership class is, uh, believe it or not, so it's September 8th, 15th, and 22nd. And just for the point, uh, a point of clarification, to become a member, we, it's all three classes. It's not like you come to one and these are three options. Just to make that clear. So we, we meet up for three weeks after service for about three hours. It's an investment of time and energy. But we're also providing lunch for you guys and child care too um, so that we have a, a good environment to have a, um, the discussions. And as, as a church, we really do see... We talk about why membership matters, why we believe it's important in the class. We're happy to answer questions about that if you have questions too, just about the process or um, why it's important. But, but um, we really see it as an opportunity for us to have all the good conversations that are necessary for us to have a, have a healthy church. You know, we don't ever want anything to be a surprise to you. We want you to have an opportunity to ask whatever questions you might have. Um, but these classes are filling up. It's, we have, I think, 20-something, 20 22 people, something like that, signed up already. And so if, so if you want to be a part of the classes, I want to encourage you to go ahead and jump in there and, and get your name in the hat, because at some point, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, we're going to have to cap it and say we're full for this time. And we do it twice a year. So September, but we'll do it again in April. So if you've been here and you feel like it's time for you to at least, you know, go through the classes and see where you stand, then I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and, and, and jump on this. So, so um, see what you think, make a decision, pray about it. And, and if you have questions, we're happy to answer those. Sound pretty good? Okay. All right. Well, let's pray together. And we're going to pray also, guys, if you'll just join me in agreement, praying our missions team is currently in Columbia. And uh, we just want to pray over them and the work that they're doing um, probably as we speak. <laughs> so, Father, we just come to you now, Lord, and thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for letting us as a church be able to send out a team, Lord God, to go and support missionary friends who are doing such a good work, Lord. And we know that you see them right where they are. You look down from heaven with joy, Lord God, and you love to bless the work of the ministry. You love to bless people who are pouring out their hearts and souls and lives for you. And so we pray for the Millers and their ministry, Lord. We pray for the, um, the ladies in the house there who are getting a second chance at life with their kids. And um, we pray for all the ministry, all the, the teaching opportunities and discipleship and things that are going to take place, Lord. All just the, in general, Lord, their interactions with people. And God, we pray that our team would find themselves full of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and full, Lord God, of just the life and the joy of God. And I pray, Father, that they also, Lord, would find just a constant sense of your help and your presence, Lord, as they serve. And we pray, God, that many people would come to Jesus because they're there. Lord, and that people who are just getting started in a walk with you would have an opportunity to be discipled, Lord, to hear the truth, to be baptized, Lord God, and that you would just let there be an outpouring of uh, just your, your presence and your power. So we commit them to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we pray, God, that here... Um, in this room today, that you would bless the word of God, Lord, as it, as it comes forth, Lord, and just as you said, your word, which goes forth from your mouth, will not return void, but will accomplish what you sent it to do. God, we trust you, we believe you, and we ask you to do it here today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> okay, so we are in Matthew 13, Matthew 13, 47. And um, we're coming to the close of the parables in this chapter. And um, yeah, that's what I'm sorry. I had this like, like my, anyway, yeah, I had something there and it kind of just it flew away. It sprung wings and flew away. That's all right. But yeah, we're coming to the end of the parables here. And um, in the, so we have this week and next week, and we'll finish up Matthew chapter 13. And then we're going to go into a series on worship, which I think is going to be really good. It feels like a timely word, um, something that's kind of been waiting in the wings. And I've, I've, been, I've been kind of eager to like, let's get this worship series going, you know what I mean? And we've been finding out that it's needed some time to kind of incubate anyway. So, but we'll be starting that in a couple of weeks. Anyway, Matthew 13. All right, let's go to the verse 47. 
Again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up onto the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this parable comes through kind of strong, doesn't it? Has a, has a real heaviness to it. And we're going to see this here, but Jesus is, is making a subtle shift in the way he's describing the kingdom of God. Last week, we looked at the treasure and the pearl. And it's the cost and it's the, and it's the, um, the, the reward, the treasure of the kingdom of God. But this word that starts out in Matthew 13, 47, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven, that word is more commonly translated on the other hand. So it's, a, so it's like saying the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure and it's like a pearl and a man sells all that he has to get it. On the other hand, there's another side of this conversation. So Jesus is shifting the discussion. He had been, as I said, describing the cost and the reward of the kingdom, but now... On the other hand, we must discuss the cost of not receiving the kingdom. And so this is where Jesus focused. He gave, he gave an interpretation of, of what happened, but he didn't talk about what happened to the good fish. He said, the good fish go in jars, and he stops, which means they're going to be kept. They're not going to be cast out. They're going to be kept. But he went into great detail to describe what happens to the fish that are not kept. And so this is a conversation that's, that's become very unco- unpopular and therefore it's become less common in the church to talk about hell, to talk about eternal punishment. And, it is, and um, so I pray for grace, you know, to share this word in, in, the, in the spirit of the Lord in a way that will be beneficial and edifying and will be in keeping with the word of God. Um, but, but we're going to talk about hell and talk about it in very direct terms today. Because um, God's word discusses it in great detail. And so years ago, we used to live in Pensacola. And in Pensacola, there were were a lot of street preachers. Sometimes it felt like on every corner, there was a street preacher at every intersection. And it wasn't literally, but sometimes it felt like that. Because you could hardly go anywhere. Um, This is like the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. It was hard to go anywhere without seeing a street preacher. And so they had the Brownsville Revival going on. The Brownsville um, Revival had a school of ministry, and they were both sending out teams of people to share the gospel and out in public. And then there was also one of the most prominent other voices that was out there was from a local, a zealous local church called Bible Baptist Church. And Bible Baptist, their preacher was well-known. His name was well-known all over town. He had a TV show. It was called Drawing Men to Christ. And he would paint pictures while he preached. That he, he, would, he, would just kind of, he would be painting while he was talking. And, um, and so it was kind of an interesting thing. But from that ministry in particular, there was a certain edge, <laughs> shall we say, on all the preaching. And the preaching that came out of Bible Baptist Church was primarily... I mean, for lack of a better term, it felt very hateful, and, and it was constantly talking about hell. And what you, and what you w- sometimes felt like, because it really depends on the spirit in which a person presents information, but it felt like sometimes they wanted people to go there. And, when, and you have to talk about hell. You can't ignore it. And we're going to talk more clearly about why that's the, why that's the case, but, but it really matters what spirit you share about hell in a spirit of love and a spirit of compassion and a spirit of hope or is it in a spirit of God's going to get you you know the so so the fear you know and using fear solely as a tactic as opposed to as opposed to here's the whole picture there are some things you need to be really concerned about but here's the whole picture you know um, so we'll talk about that but we <clears throat> had lots of encounters with different people at different times um, and 
it, and sometimes you, you could tell, there were people out there, I'd say street preachers out at, in Pensacola at that time who, you could tell like, this guy's not representing anybody's ministry. He's not promoting himself or anyone else. He's out here on his own dime and he's holding up a sign that says, repent and believe the gospel. Or he's holding up a sign that says, have you believed or, or you must be saved or it's just a quotation of scripture. And so you would get the impression many times, it's like this person just sincerely cares that people hear the truth and know the truth. Um, but I was actually a part of conversations, interactions with a lot of the people from the other at, uh, church that I described. Um, and man, they just wanted you, like, they just wanted you to be a devil. They say, they believe, you know, and that's the way they talk, would talk to people sometimes. One of my roommates, they told him he was a devil because he had tattoos. And, he, and they said, tell, you know, they, they got him in this word trap, and it was a King James only word trap. If you didn't say it just so in the King James, then, then you were, then you, and so they said, see, gotcha, you're a devil. Like they said this to my friend who was a born, his testimony was incredible. He'd been a neo-Nazi, like skinhead, to, radically saved by Jesus, and without knowing anything about him because he had tattoos, they, anyway. You get, that's called being judgmental. <laughs> that's what that's called, you know. When you, when you make superficial assessments and you set traps for people, and that sounds like the Pharisees, doesn't sound like Jesus. Um, but, but so what's happened within, this is my point in saying all this, what's happened within the culture is that we have gotten very gun shy in talking about eternal damnation. And should we be careful with it? Oh, absolutely. It's a loaded gun. You know what I mean? And if you want to have, in your, inner, your gospel interaction with a person can sometimes hinge on how you talk about eternity because you can blow the opportunity. You know what I mean? If you, you have to lead a person gently into, into the picture, into the larger picture because they have to really understand some things about God as opposed to just this, here's this fire and he wants to throw people in it who don't do what he says. So you have to, you have, to have the whole discussion. So let's look at the picture that Jesus painted. We're going to just walk through it piece by piece. So first of all, the net is cast into the sea, which is a picture of spreading the gospel to catch men. And you remember Jesus said that to, to Peter and, his, and, and John and them, and he said, he said, you've been fishers of fish, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. It's the picture of you know, casting a net to catch people. And so the picture Jesus is giving here is a drag net, it's cast generally into the sea. You know, when you're fishing with a line, you're using certain bait and you've got a target. You've got a kind of fish you're trying to catch. That's not this. This is a drag net. It's a general casting of, um, of a net to catch whatever it can catch. And that's the way the, um, the Great Commission is, is or is a... <laughs> you all want to just stop and pray for me to get my words together? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, that's the way that in the Great Commission, Jesus said, you know, preach the gospel to every creature. Cast the net wide, cast it broad. And, and then whatever it catches, it catches. And I think it's really good for us to consider, um, just a little aside here, to consider our role in the larger picture. I think the best way for you to think of yourself is to think of yourself as one thread in the larger net. Because nets, you know, a net from a, from, you know, you look at it, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a sheet. It's a bunch of string that has holes all in it. Because the net's got to let things pass through, but the net, the size of the hole is really important because it's tailored to catch certain things. And so, but if the, stra if the strands, it's really more of a weave, it's really actually more of a continuous weave. But if you think of it like this, if, if I'm this one little piece of the weave and I break, I fail to do what I'm supposed to do, the hole just got bigger. And now fish are slipping through. And if every person thought of themselves like this, like I'm just, I'm one piece of the net. I can't make anybody else do anything. It's not my responsibility before God necessarily to make anybody else do anything. But I, for my part, can hold with integrity my piece of the net. So in my circle, with my friends, with the people that God um, has put in my life, I have opportunities. I'm going to step into those opportunities because I, for my part, I'm going to hold the net together. Amen? That's kind of what, I think that's a good way for us to think of our role in the world as believers and a part of the larger net. Then, <clears throat> the gathering of the fish 
of every kind, it says, both good and bad, is the gathering effect that the gospel has on every creature. So what the, the, the commission to preach the gospel to every creature, to go into all the world, what it does is it brings every person who hears the gospel to a decision point. It push, it's, it's sort of like a funnel. It brings everybody into a point where you have to say, now I've heard this, and now I have to make a decision about what I believe. And so the gospel does have, the net does catch all kinds. And, and people who've heard the gospel, they are going to carry that with them. You know what I mean? And there's going to be other times when God gives them, if they don't respond to the gospel the first time they hear it, they, they, God gives them up other opportunities and he, he tailors the circumstances of their life. God is such a, like a, um, he's a miracle worker. God is constantly moving people and lives and circumstances toward his, toward the truth, toward an understanding of it, toward, you know, he wants us to get the message what I'm trying to say. So this is the gathering effect. It brings all people together to make to a decision point. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, the scripture says this phrase. It says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And this is an, in part like what we're talking about here, but um, this is a verse that has become popular with, I mean, people use the term universalist. It's like, don't you see, like, because it says in Adam all die, well, everybody dies in their sin, but because of what Jesus did, don't you see, everybody's going to be saved. Like, that's kind of the idea. But here's the difference, and here's where I would disagree with that assessment based on, and by the way, one verse out of context is not the best way to, to build a doctrine, but here's, here's what we have, though. Here's the truth. Every single person who's born is in Adam. True or false? True. You can't help it. You can get mad at Adam, but you can't do a thing about it. He's in the family tree. And when Adam fell, we fell. And it's in our nature. We are born in sin. Now, so there's the first half. So as in Adam, all die. True. Also in Christ, all will be made alive. Are all people in Christ? No. So clearly, the verse is referring to the reality that whoever comes in is freed from the curse that came to us by Adam that every person inherits. But only in Christ is anyone made alive. So, and then the, the more, the more uh, emphatic way of stating the same truth is in Christ, you are made fully alive. You are, you're, and, uh, uh, Jesus said, I came that they may have life, and that more abundantly. And that's, the, that's an abundant life while you live and an abundant eternal life that never dies. And that's what, that's what we receive in Christ. We're set free from the curse that came to us through Adam. Um, but this is not a promise of universal salvation. So the scripture says, when it was filled, speaking of the net, when it was filled, and that's an expression indicating that there's going to be an end of the ingathering work of the church through the gospel. There's going to come a day where, God, where the net is out and the gospel is catching fish and God says, all right, it's full. And that's what we call the end of the age of grace. The gospel ceases at that moment. Now, this is the end of all time. This is not like God leaves the world to go on, but nobody has any hope. No, the world is coming to an end. It's the end of all times. It's right in here, and I don't know exactly how it works out to the minute or whatever, but somewhere right in here is where Jesus comes back. Somewhere right in here is where it all, everything, the, the culmination of time comes to an end, but there is an end where the gathering work of the gospel is finished, the net is full. <clears throat> then drawing the net up onto the beach is a picture of the extraction of all the gathered fish from the world to be sorted by God. So the, the ocean, the sea is a picture of the world because that's where all the fish live. The net is cast as the gospel that collects all the fish. Well, the fish have now been gathered up. You know how they do in fishing. They pull it up to the edge of the boat and now they're going to get it to shore and drag it out of the water and onto the dry land. So now it's a removal from one environment into another. So everybody leaves the world and goes to a place that the scripture calls the judgment and, um, and all the fish are sorted by God. 
And every person experiences this sorting. Every person will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul stated that emphatically. All believers, all unbelievers. <clears throat> this is important to remember in this conversation. Goodness and badness, good fish, bad fish, is not based on nature or deeds. And let me explain what I mean by that. Nature would be, there are people who, you guys, I'm sure you've heard this. Maybe you've said it yourself. But there are people who will point at somebody and go, well, that person, well, they're just beyond hope. That's a bad egg, bad seed. You know what I mean? And it's like trying to just kind of like, oh, we've tried and tried, but that person's beyond hope. And what I want to say is that's where God likes to do his best work. Is when people who everybody says is hopeless and God says, okay, you've all tried in your own strength, so how about you let me show you what I can do? And then some person, you know, in simplicity of faith, uh, walks into the situation, shares Christ with them in a way that they can hear it, by, and by a miracle of grace, this, that person is redeemed. So this is not about how a person is born. By, it's not nature, whereas this is kind of where it deviates a little bit from the fish picture. It's like, if I catch this kind of fish, I'm throwing it back. But if I catch this fish, well, these are good eating. You know, that's the way actual fishing takes place. So this is a little different from that. But, good, but goodness and badness are not based on nature or deeds. The other thing is, deeds are an indicator, but they are certainly not the only factor. Um, because if you and I were just all weighed out on the basis of our deeds, guess what? Nobody's saved. Nobody's saved. So it's not just a matter of deeds. And here's the reality. This is the beautiful thing about being in Christ. When you come to Christ in faith, whatever your deeds were in the past, it's all gone. It's all washed away. Your, guess what? Your good deeds and your bad deeds, whew, gone. And now there is just the righteousness of Christ. And that's, that's what's amazing. It's like you can't, after Christ, you can't point back to the good stuff. It's like, no, it's all gone. The bad, the good, everything. Because in Christ, is, it, his righteousness is our only plea before God. So it's righteousness being imparted by faith. So the, the fish are gathered in, and it's how they responded to the gospel net, so to speak, that really determines whether the fish is good or the fish is bad. <clears throat> then the gathering of the good fish, great news, is the homecoming of the children of God after the judgment, where Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. And what are these words? Enter into the joy of your master. And this is what I've been saying. It's like, um, we don't spend enough time thinking about this. We don't spend enough time thinking about eternity in general. We're kind of getting, we're kind of, we're, we've bec- the church in general, I would say, has become more worldly. We have become, we think much more about this temporal life. The old language was, I'm just a pilgrim passing through. And Christians were taught to think that way from childhood. I'm just a pilgrim. Like, I don't have to have it all here because I'll have it all there. While I'm here, I can give and sacrifice and do, and do the things that are necessary because I'm laying up reward that I can keep forever. And that's an eternal mindset. And... I'm just speaking frankly, I, I struggle with it myself. The church is losing that eternal mindset. So it's something to pray about. It's something to be a matter, a matter of a real concern. But what we wait for is at the judgment, and by the way, no one survives the judgment apart from the righteousness of Christ. You, nobody gets through. But because of the righteousness of Christ, all the sin is forgiven. Every good thing that we did now is rewardable. That's really amazing. And God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And now sickness, sorrow, all, sighing, all these things flee away and it's eternal joy forever. And that's our inheritance. So Jesus didn't say much about it, but I thought I'd say a little word about it. Something for you to think about, something for you to consider, something for you to look forward to. Because at the end of the day, you need to know it is worth everything that it costs for you to serve God with all your life. You need to know that. And you've got to settle that. You know what I mean? I think, I talked about value of the decision a few weeks ago. I think so many believers have not made up their minds that they're going to serve God with every breath and fiber of their being until they die, whatever it costs. And I, that's, not a, that's not something that like, oh, well, people who are in vocational ministry have to do that. But as for me, I just kind of go to work and then sometimes pray. No, it's like, you're just looking for ways to glorify God. That's the life of a believer. 
And there are people in vocational ministry who have a lot smaller reward than people who work their job to the glory of God. It's just a fact. It's really all about how your heart is oriented and how you live your life. So, but look forward to the joy because it's all worth it. So throwing away the bad fish then is explained specifically. The angels sort them out from those who have been made righteous through faith in Jesus. They're separated from each other. So then the gospel having run its course in every offer of grace rejected, the wicked are thrown into the furnace of fire. So Jesus could have stopped there. He could have said, and then the fish that, you know, I mean, he's not using that language, but whoever rejected Christ, rejected the gospel, he said, are thrown into the furnace of fire. He could have stopped there. But Jesus wanted to give us a picture. He wanted us to see behind the veil. He wanted us to know what the atmosphere is like in the furnace of fire. And he said these words, he said, for in that place there, is we- there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this weeping and gnashing of teeth indicates the horrifying reality of the furnace of fire. And that's this, that hell is eternal torment. And um, there, there's, really nothing, there's really nothing that we can compare this to. And it's, it's, it's frightening and it's shocking to us. Um, but it's the reality that God is, is revealing. So if, if you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the whole idea was get the fire super hot, throw these guys in there, and they're just going to be burned up. Remember, even the guys who tried to throw them in the fire were killed by the heat of the fire. So it was almost an instant death to be thrown into a fire, especially an extremely hot fire. We're going to probably say if God, I don't know how this, you know, the place, the Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Did you know the Bible says that? It says that specifically. It's interesting. It doesn't say anything about people. It says it was created for the devil and his angels. So if God made it, inevitably, it's an extremely hot fire. And, and so he's created, there's this, so there's this fire. And so anyway, my point is, you bring, the, if you throw somebody into an extremely hot fire, it's kind of over pretty quick. The picture that Jesus is painting is weeping while in the fire. Teeth gnashing, chewing, because of the experience of pain in the fire. Do I wish it didn't have to be that way? I kind of do. Because, of, because your heart just breaks for, at the thought that anyone would ever end up in a place like that. But, and I'll say this too, because there's a lot of, there are a lot of thoughts going around in the church. I think universalism is making another surge. I think it makes a surge in every generation to try to, just to try to, try to, try to, try to water down the truths that the church has held steadfastly for many generations and um, we are very good with the idea of, of heaven being eternal. We don't even argue about it. We don't study the Greek words to find out whether or not it actually means eternal. We just say, oh, heaven's eternal. But when we find out that hell could be eternal and that it could be everlasting and that the person could, could continue in torment and not perish, well, it troubles us. And so, and so we'll dig into it and look into things. But what I'm trying to say through all this is God is a just God and he offers you an eternal reward that will never cease, that's full of joy. So if the counterpart is also eternal, that might just be the justice of God. And he wants you to know, he wants you to know that making the sacrifice and living for him is not just a great reward, it's, it's a tremendous salvation. And so... Salvation loses its meaning if you're not being saved from anything, from anything uh, on the same scale. So, <clears throat> Revelation 14.11 says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest. Who? These people who are in this furnace of fire. They have no rest day and night. And he talks about this because Revelation is oriented in a certain time period 
He says, um, those who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. If you know the scriptures, um, you have to deny Jesus to take the mark of the beast. And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a secures, I would say, however, however you want to say it, one's condemnation. But um, believers are at the same time refusing to take the mark and paying with their lives. But, Jesus, but he says here, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. It indicates an eternal punishment. So I was challenged recently to look these things up and see if it actually means that. And so I did. And so this is what I found. Um, forever and ever, the phrase in Greek is the words eons and eons. And the word, and this is from the Greek lexicon, it says forever. An unbroken age, perpetuity, that's continuing of time, ongoing nature of time, or we also use the phrase eternity. And so it'd be one thing if it said they were cast into a furnace of fire for an eon singular. Then you could say, oh, maybe that's a period, maybe that's a closed period of time. Maybe it's a long time, but maybe it's a closed period of time. But the scripture makes it plural. So then it says cast into a furnace of fire for eons So how many is that? How many periods of time? But then it doesn't stop there. It says plural eons and additional plural eons. It sounds like what we're working with here is an idiom that we translate forever and ever because it's interminal, it's an interminal loop of repeated eons that amount to eternity. And uh, it's extremely bleak. Not just bleak, it's entirely hopeless. And I don't know anyone, any one of us, we've all been in situations that we use that we would use the phrase hopeless. It was a hopeless situation. In life, there's actually always a little hope. In this eternal punishment, there is actual fixed hopelessness. It never ceases. <clears throat> and so people, people will say that this kind of thing is used to manipulate people, to, to make them afraid. And, and very often, so, and, and it, I, you know what, I'll tell you what, that will make anybody afraid. But here's the thing. This is the, fra- this is the expression I use. If you've been in the church any length of time, you've probably heard me say this before. But um, if I'm driving down the highway and I, come, and I regularly take a bridge you know, to get across to wherever it is, I'm going to work or whatever, and I come across and the bridge has collapsed. And so I'm coming up on the edge and I see it and I screech to a halt and I stop and I get out of my car and I look and I'm like, oh my goodness, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. If I stay on this course, it's gonna mean my own destruction. So what I do is I turn around, I drive back up the road, I park my car across the highway so nobody can pass. And then people start coming. And as they arrive, they're screeching to a halt. And they realize, I'm not a police officer. I don't have any, what's going on? He said, why, why, why are you blocking the road? It's like, well, yeah, no, you don't, hold on, hold on. Why, don't be angry with me. Just understand, the bridge is out. If you stay on this course, it will mean your own destruction. So then, so now, so now take this into the context of, of, of hell and eternal punishment. If you talk about hell, people will say, man, you know what? I'm sick of all this hate speech. But consider this. If the bridge is out and I'm blocking the way and saying, don't go down that road, it's going to lead to your own destruction. Is that hate? Could that possibly be motivated by hate? No, it's just that you don't want to believe it. So you say, I want to live my life however I want to live my life with no consequences. And so you're living in a dream world. You don't get to choose what's real and what's not. There is a God who's made everything, and he has fixed an order. And there are some things that it doesn't matter how much God likes you or whatever. If you're one of his favorites, it doesn't matter. The Bible says he doesn't have favorites. I'm just using a figure of speech, but it doesn't. It wouldn't matter if you were his favorite. We are all in this continuum. And it applies to all people because God is perfectly just. And so he's offering this opportunity of salvation. You don't have to take the road that leads to destruction. You can take this other road, and through the cross of Christ, a bridge has been built. And you can pass over safely to a place of etern- to, of, to eternal life and joy forever with God. So what does this tell us? It tells us that even though the wrath of God is fierce, so is his love. His love is just as ferocious as his, as his wrath is. Sin must be punished 
but God has made a way. And God, and guess what? You know, God didn't just say, okay, fine, I'll give you a little way to be saved. He took his most precious son and offered him up in our place. So I get, I'll admit, I get a little frustrated when people point fingers at God and try to make him out like he's the one who's not fair. When the person is at the core, just wanting to live however they want to live with no consequences. What I'm saying is, you know, God has made every sacrifice. He's made the way possible. God is perfectly just. He's holy. He's pure. He's righteous. Sin must be punished, but he has given you a way. He has given you a way, not only to escape punishment, but to receive a reward that far exceeds anything you could ever imagine. So his love is fierce. There's a song like that, I think. But John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world. Did you notice that it says so loved? That we would rephrase that, loved so much. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. And we often forget about the next verse, but it says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. The word judge is to condemn in judgment. He did not send his son to bring judgment and condemnation into the world, but that the world might be saved through him. What was God's heart, his intention, to make sure that that the, the condemnation of the wicked was sealed when he sent Jesus? No, just the opposite. He wanted to make sure that the path to salvation was opened up and that all were invited into it. That's what God did. So I think we stop pointing fingers at God. You guys, can we agree on that? And by the way, in just your day-to-day life, if you know that your default mode when something goes wrong in your life is to get mad at God and blame him for something, I would like to encourage you to stop doing that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being funny. I'm being serious about this. I wouldn't like to encourage you. That's a bad habit you've gotten into, and you need to change the habit. You need to reprogram, and you need to stop for a second, and you need to say, what part did I play in the problem I'm experiencing? And you need to ask yourself, is this just because I live in a broken world? Doesn't the Bible also say time and chance happen to all? It says that. That means something. Is there a randomness factor to all of this? Is the devil attacking me? You need to consider that. And then, at the end of the day, you take all of that investigation and you carry that into the presence of God with a humble, not accusatory heart. And you say, God, I'm really struggling with what's happening in my life right now. Would you have mercy and help me understand it? And let God speak. He speaks with such tender mercy and he gives clarity. And that clarity will be a part of your testimony for the rest of your life. So I'm just going to leave that with you to consider. But this has been true of God because we're, so this, brings, this conversation brings all the nature of God together into one merging point where you, have to cons- you, have to, you need to know God. If you want to have less confusion in your heart and in your mind, especially about difficult things, you need to make the number one priority of your life to get to know God. Search, search for him in the scriptures. Search for him in prayer. Search for him in church services. Search for him out in the world. Look for him in every place that you go and ask him to reveal himself to you. You need to know what God is really like no matter what you want him to be. That's what we really need. But this has always been true of God. In Exodus 34, Moses asked God to reveal himself. Moses said, show me your glory. Moses was sitting, I picture it, I don't know why I picture it this way, but he goes into the tent of meeting and it's almost like him and God at a table together talking like friends. He can't see God, but the glory is there. And he says, show me your glory. And it's like he's already been seeing the glory of God in some degree, but he says, show me your glory. And God says, well, you can't handle the full revelation. So here's what I'll do. There's a broken up piece of rock out there, and I'm going to take you. And so God, and God, you know, I don't know how he picks him up or whatever, but he puts Moses into the broken rock, which is a picture of Jesus, by the way, the cleft of the rock where you and I are safe to behold the glory of God puts him in the cleft of the rock, and then God says, I'm going to pass by and you can see my back. The best deal I can offer today. And, and Moses, of course, that's what he can get, so that's what he gets. So God 
now passes by and Moses sees his glory. And here's what God says about himself. Now we believe in the scriptures, all scriptures God breathed. We believe it's all from his mouth, but it's extra special when God is talking about himself, just right from his own mouth. And listen to this. The Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. You hear all that? Mercy, compassion, opportunities for, you know, to know the truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. All the things he could punish and judge, God says, I'm looking for ways to forgive. But then he says after this, yet, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So God is just like, he's like, this is me. Here's a whole ton of stuff about how my heart is full of compassion and love and opportunities for forgiveness. But at the end of the day, I'm also just. I cannot leave sin unpunished. <clears throat> Psalm 9, 20, Psalm 9, verse 20 says, put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. And when you see something like this, put them in fear. It's like, well, he really hates those people. It's like, well, hold on just a second. Let's stop and consider what happens if God answers. This is a prayer. What happens if God answers this prayer? The nations who hate God, who oppose God, who fight against him with every breath in their mouth, who worship false gods, they are self-condemned. And he says, put them in fear. Let them understand the fearful things of God. Let them see. We sang that song, fear God, give him glory. You know, that's a direct quote from Revelation. That's not just a song lyric. Fear God, give him glory. If God answers this prayer, the nations who have rejected God and been arrogant in their hearts, suddenly they begin to realize something, that they're just men. They begin to realize that they're mortal. They begin to realize that they will die someday, but God is forever. God is eternal. And the only way that I can have any kind of a hope for eternity is for me to get on God's side, to agree with God. And so that's exactly what this is a prayer for, that these nations would humble themselves because as long as they're proud and arrogant and fighting against God, they never can really know him. And so I think it's just important for us to see the picture, the whole picture, and to realize the heart behind what God is really, uh, is really after. So I want to share with you guys a testimony. This, um, this is my grandfather's testimony. I've shared, I think, at different times, pieces of it or maybe the whole thing. But this little track right here, this was printed probably in the 60s or 70s, um, says the awful reality of hell. You guys can probably see from where you're sitting that this is uh, an ancient typeset. Um, it's, this is an old track. Um, but... Uh, but um, yeah, and I, anyway, I guess all I could say. But I, the first time I saw this on my grandmother's dining room table, I, I saw it and I was like, man, these, these people really make their rounds, don't they? Because uh, I had the mindset of most people, young, young people, I'm thinking like, man, this is probably some hate track. And I had no idea what was inside. So I'm going to share with you what's inside. This is how, this is how my grandfather came to Jesus. He said, <clears throat> only one time... Only once in my lifetime, either before or after my conversion, has anybody ever asked me, are you saved? As I walked along the streets of Tampa, Florida many years ago, a young man darted out of a dark alley, walked beside me a moment as I eyed him suspiciously, and turning to me, he said, say, are you saved? And then he disappeared into the night. So I stopped at the traffic light, and before it turned from red to green, I said to myself, bewildered, saved? Saved? Save from what? The Lord surely heard this remark and undertook to give me 16 months of instruction concerning it. From November 1935 to June 1937, I was confined to my bed with a raging case of tuberculosis, which grew steadily worse until February 27, 1937. Shortly after I became ill, I began to think much about the years that I had spent in self-will, drunkenness, and debauchery. I had the horribly mistaken idea that God weighed our good deeds against our evil deeds and led us into heaven or shut us out accordingly. But so far as I knew, I had committed no good deeds. I finally remember dropping a coin into the hat of a blind man one day, but could remember no other noble acts in my entire life. One day I crawled up on the sloping roof of our home in Tallahassee, Florida to get some of the cool night air. 
Below me and on the opposite side of the roof lay Fisher's Green, where a tent had been pitched and an evangelist was preaching. He had a tremendous voice, and I heard him cry out, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out undiluted, without mixture, into the cup of his wrath and indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of his holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no respite, no pause, no intermission, no rest, no peace, day or night. So there was born in on me the awful reality of hell. I thought of little else until the day I was saved. It seemed my inevitable destination. I was in unutterable despair and without hope. Instead of turning to the passages in the Bible which tell of the incredible grace and mercy of God, I searched only to see if somehow, sometime, the fires of hell would die down or I could be mercifully blotted out from the midst of the awful torment I would soon endure. And how many know that's very common? This is what I was describing earlier. People search the scriptures to find a way out of hell, to try to make hell less than it seems to be, to try some loophole somewhere, please God, like that's their hope. But he says, verse by verse, I I looked even more intent than a condemned man searching out books of law to escape the electric chair. My despair and horror grew. I found that in Job alone, there were 99 verses dealing with the punishment of the wicked. There was not a ray of hope that once there I could ever get out or that the awful punishment would ever cease. I found that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah were still alive in the terrible fires that were poured out upon them. Quote, so also Sodom and Gomorrah are now before us as an example of the eternal fire and the punishment which they are undergoing, Jude, verse 6 and 7. I saw that hell should be spelled with a capital letter, for it is an actual place. I discovered that the man in the news account of Luke 16 did not dare to ask to get out, for he plainly knew he was beyond all hope. I saw a picture of a man coming into my room and saying to me, now tomorrow you will be in hell. What are your plans when you get there? I saw that if all the councils of the world met and set out to discover what would be the greatest horror the human mind could imagine, all would fall inestimably short of the reality of hell. I lived in hell without hope, tormented in mind and soul and spirit and body. My sins revolving with the cycles of the years, cast away on the trash heap of the universe, Alone, my cries unheeded forever and ever. Mother could not help me. Father could not help me. I was in hell. And this was his experience, just contemplating it and realizing that that was where he was headed. And it's not in this account, but my grandfather reported that while he was laying on his bed, dying of tuberculosis, he was my height, about, and 90 pounds. He was so diminished, like a Holocaust victim, and, and he would have no strength, no, no energy left to do anything. And laying on, it, on his bed, he, he said, this is the way he put it, I didn't have a vision. God opened hell and let me see in. And he said he saw mountains of fire in, in, in a sea of fire between the mountains and men rolling in agony in the, in the sea of fire between the mountains. And he said he saw this, and, and there was this, this impression from God of like, this is where you are headed. And so he said, just before death, I took one last chance, threw myself on the thin hope that Christ might possibly care even for me. I begged mercy as a prodigal son and pled with God that he would not send me to that awful place. And oh, wonder of wonders. I found myself safe in the arms of Jesus, snatched clean away from the place I had nearly entered, pulled out of that fire, filled to this day with joy and peace unutterable, called to his matchless service. It was all because he had endured the eternities of hell for me. It was all because of the place of the skull where he had drained dry every drop of the cup of the wine of the wrath of God Almighty for me. And so that's... This was the story that, uh, this was how God brought him to Christ. He reported that after, his, after, he was, after he was born again, first of all, he was immediately healed of tuberculosis. 
the doctors came in and they said, what's going on with you? You know, like he, he was, in, it was, it was like the disease was gone from his body, but he had been so diminished, he had to heal. So he's in the hospital for a while, just get, getting strength back. And so while he said he'd look out the window of, of his hospital room and he said he saw colors he had never seen in all of his life. His world was changed by Jesus coming in. And then, and he, and there was a man down the hall who was like this nasty man screaming at the nurses, you know, whatever, smashing his food tray. Just sounds like the worst guy. And our, my grandfather would go down the hall when he had the strength to do it and just sit with that man and read the newspaper to him and just try to show him the love of Christ. But his life was transformed. And he went on and became a minister. He became a preacher, I think Presbyterian at first. And I ended up getting out of ministry later. But in the town, actually, where he lived and where he met my grandmother, they called him the happy preacher. As he walked with a spring in his step. And um, all that done because God showed him the inevitable destination of every soul that rejects Jesus and offered him a way out. And that's the bad news that sets up the most beautiful good news that anyone could ever hear. And if you don't know the bad news, the good news doesn't make any sense at all. This is why the devil fights so hard to chip away at our, because if you don't believe in the problem, the solution doesn't mean anything. And so this is what God wants to do in each of our hearts, because as believers, you know what? We need to just take a minute and thank you, God, for what you saved me from. And then to share with other people and share with them, say, you have to realize what happens if you reject Jesus. This is the inevitable outcome. But if you accept Jesus, look at all the glory that waits for you. That's how we are meant by God to share our faith. So we'll close with this. I think it's time. Y'all go ahead and stand up. So Jesus says to his disciples, after all these parables and all these pictures of the kingdom of God, he looks at his disciples in Matthew 13, 51, and Jesus says, have you understood all these things? (laughs) I just think this is so funny because then they said to him, yeah, got it. Yes. And you know they had questions. You know they had so much they wanted to ask him. But for the moment, yeah, we've heard it. We're taking it all in. And Jesus said, therefore, every scribe who's become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. And so these scribes had been, had been translating the, the um, copies, the manuscripts of scripture, and they did it word perfect. When they wrote the holy name of God, they stopped and they bathed themselves, a cleansing ritual, because they had such reverence for the accuracy and the authenticity. They had reverence for God, but also for the purity of his word. And he said, those scribes, when they become disciples of the kingdom, guess what God does? He redeems all the old, all the stuff they've been studying and learning. And guess what's coming? A whole new set of scriptures, a whole new treasure of joy to experience. And not just scriptures, but also a whole new life in God and the new covenant. So we have these two things set against each other. We have the, the, the horrible outcome of rejecting the kingdom of God, but then we have this, this beautiful picture of a life in God that's offered to every person. And if we become disciples of the kingdom, he wants to give you a treasury out of which you can draw things new and old. <clears throat> so God is good, he's faithful, and he never... He never abandons us. He, le- he, he never leaves us, never forsakes us. And he offers us so much grace that's undeserved. So our prayer teams are available. And um, I just want to say, like, if you're in here this morning and you don't really know where you stand with Jesus, this is your, this is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity. Because Jesus came to save the world from that condemnation, the condemnation we talked about this morning. He came, and you put your faith in him, your hope in him, trust him for eternal salvation, and Jesus saves you from that. And he saves you for himself and for God. And he saves you unto a glorious life and eternity that's lived with him. So... Don't, don't let this moment slip away. If God is speaking, come down, pray with our prayer teams. Come kneel at the altar. It's time to confess our sins to God. It's time to say out loud what we've been up to, to put it into the light and to let God cleanse us and wash all those things away and to let him give us a whole new life by the spirit of Christ. And if you're a believer and you've been far away from God, 
Don't live like that. People say, you know, if you're, if, you're in, if you're lukewarm, if you're backslidden, you're not enjoying sin and you're not enjoying God. Your life is misery. And Jesus wants you to come all the way in. He wants you to come all the way over. Forsake your sin and turn to God and live with a whole heart for Jesus. Let's just open up our hands like this. Lord God, we just are asking you now to speak to us. Bring conviction, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. Lead us in the path that leads to life, Lord God. And I pray every person who needs to know Jesus would know Jesus. Every person who needs to get back in touch with Jesus and walk with you. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just bring that clarity and the conviction now. And I pray that we would take an action today. That we would step out from where we are, Lord. And allow you, God, to, uh, to commit again, Lord, to walk before you. But not in our own strength. In the strength and the power that you supply. So we pray for that new life to come flooding in, for restoration, rejuvenation, for healing, whatever we need, God. We know it's all with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.